today uh, so he can get on with his talk. Jerome Thompson is the state curator for the State Historical Society of Iowa. He's based out of our Des Moines office. He's worn so many hats over the years, I can't even keep track of them all. He's been head of our museum. He's been our sites manager. At the moment, he's the acting administrator of the State Historical Society of Iowa. Uh, he provides professional and technical assistance and training to local historical organizations and museums around the state. He's been at the State Historical Society since 1982, uh, but he actually before that was an administrator at Terrace Hill, the governor's mansion. A native of Ames, he's a graduate of Iowa State in anthropology. He began his work in museums as an archaeologist at the Texas State University Museum, where he obtained his MA in museum science in 1977. He's also worked for the Minnesota Historical Society, was the first site coordinator at Terrace Hill, a National Historic Landmark, and he's contributed many articles to professional journals and publications. He's an active member of some of those groups, including the American Association for State and Local History and the Iowa Museum Association, where he serves on the board and was president from 1991 to 1993. So if you join me in welcoming Jerome, I'm sure he'll delight you with his talk today. Thank you. Thank you, Mary. The program that I'm doing today, the Museum Curator in the Meskwaki, is one that I actually prepared in uh, 2008 for a Meskwaki uh, symposium that was done um, at the settlement at Tama. It kind of came about because ever since I started working for the Historical Society um, at, in, in our Des Moines offices, I've become very interested in studying the uh, uh, Native American collections that we have that number about 3,000 objects and in doing that research for NAGPRA purposes and other types of reporting uh, I came often and often and more times than not going back to the records of uh, Edgar Harlan. Edgar Harlan was the second curator of what was then called the Iowa Historical Department. I'm going to digress just a little bit so that you might be able to understand a little of the history. The State Historical Society has been harvesting for 151 years. The museum in Des Moines has only been harvesting since 1892. And that was the time when the legislature created what was called the Iowa Historical Collection. Charles Aldrich, who was a newspaper man and former legislator uh, among many hats that he wore, from uh, Webster City, Iowa, became the first curator of that collection, and Harlan succeeded him. Harlan's papers involve a finding aid that is 12 volumes. It's an amazing trove of the documentation of not only his nearly 30 years of, of professional work, but uh, uh, so many aspects of, of Iowa history. Edgar Harlan, uh, this is a photograph of him about 1912. Uh, he had been curator uh, succeeding Charles Aldrich upon his death, and Aldrich was permanently appointed to that position in 1909. He was a native of Kiyosakwa, Iowa, and uh, was actually uh, attended Drake University uh, Law School and was first uh, uh, county attorney for Van Buren County. And during that time, he was working to um, help his father-in-law, George Duffield, prepare his reminiscences of early pioneer life in Van Buren County for the Annals of Iowa. At that time, he became acquainted with Aldrich, and Aldrich must have been a real smooth talker because he talked him out of being a lawyer and asking him to come to work for him. And Harlan agreed. And I think for the benefit of Iowa history, it was a very good choice on his part a good choice for us. In his tenure, Harlan championed the development of many aspects of the museum's collections, ranging from uh, social history, natural history. If you visit the museum in Des Moines, you'd be able to see examples of uh, uh, stuffed bison, stuffed moose, uh, stuffed elk, stuffed bears that were all because of Professor Joseph Stepan, who was a taxidermist that Harlan brought from the Field Museum to do work in Iowa. These are uh, uh, still there and things that you can see. Um, in the 1920s and 30s, um, Harlan engaged the press to help uh, engage Iowans in, in the study of their history. He would do articles that were carried in newspapers all around the state 
and in 1930 he began a project with WHO Radio in Des Moines to do uh, history talks that were then broadcast. Unfortunately, uh, in the archives of WHO, none of those have been found, but I think it would be really interesting to hear his voice after so many years. Also in the 1930s, he kind of uh, was ahead of his time. Um, many museums today will circulate traveling trunks to go around to schools, and Harlan did these as well as we were rummaging through and cleaning the basement of the museum, getting prepared for the move, we found all of these things that we suspected were old steamer trunks. But when we opened them up, we found such things in them as owls and other types of critters that had been taxidermied. These things would be, and you can tell by looking at the, at the trunks themselves, that they have had uh, train stickers that include all sorts of destinations around the state that they were sent for children to be able to see some of these specimens that they may not have ever seen in their life or at the time were concerned that they may be uh, going extinct. During um, an hour after World War I, one of the projects that Harlan took on was the documentation of Iowan service during the First World War. We have volunteers today that are uh, here working on the uh, World War II uh, uh, clippings uh, file. Harlan did similar types of work uh, in, in after World War I. He had a, a, actually a dream and a design to build an addition onto the museum for a veteran's wing. And that was going along rather splendidly until the stock market crash of 1929, and uh, that project never came to fruition. Harlan was not only active in, in terms of um, his work with the historical department. He was on the board of the first conservation commission and was um, involved in locating Iowa's first state park, which is Backbone, which was ded dedicated in uh, 1920. And then in 1921, I guess that pull towards home in Kiyosakwa led to our second state park, which is now Lacey Kiyosakwa State Park, uh, that was next to his home. He also was involved in, in uh, work to uh, deal with various monuments, uh, the William Boyd Allison Monument and others uh, that are around on the State House grounds. He was instrumental in that work. But the thing that I want to talk about today is Harlan's interest in collecting Native American materials and uh, his, his uh, special bond that he developed with the Meskwaki people. This is a picture of Edgar Harlan in 1924 and he's dressed in a ribbon shirt and sash for a particular occasion. Um, he was adopted in 1924. This photograph is from 1919. He, Harlan had worked to secure many collections, <clears throat> some of those from Louise Driscoll, J.S. Carpenter, uh, Judge Caleb Davis from uh, Keokuk, Iowa, through his daughter Anne. These were some of the things that are magnificent pieces. Uh, uh, later this year, uh, Michael Smith, who's one of my colleagues, is curating a show of some of the Native American collections uh, for the museum. Uh, I think uh, given some of the uh, uncertainty with uh, budget situations and that, we don't have an exact date on that one to happen, but it will be. Uh, it's in the works. Um, one of the people that Harlan collected from was a man named W.R. Lesser. Lesser was an Indian agent for the, the Meskwaki tribe from 1890 to 1894. Uh, Lesser was later a land agent uh, for the U.S. Land Office in Nebraska, but uh, he resided in Tama. I did come across an interesting story about Mr. Lesser. Uh, is that uh, he was later removed from his position because he kept filing reports from his home in Tama and never actually being out with boots on the ground in Nebraska. <laughs> um, I guess they frowned upon that. Harlan developed a special relationship with the tribe and he was adopted uh, in 1923 with the name Mashika or Snapping Turtle. Uh, Harlan approached the collections with the Meskwaki 
in, in, a, in a very systematic and um, almost uh, anthropological way. I think he wanted to do that with every collector that he uh, obtained materials from, but I don't believe that they approached it the same way. Uh, we find very, very little documentation on how, say, Louise Driscoll obtained material or how uh, J.S. Carpenter obtained material. We just have it. We can identify it by tribe, but we don't know the stories behind it. Harlan took that to a new level. One of the things we find in his papers are actually transcriptions of meetings that he had with the Meskwaki as there were different materials that were being offered for him to collect. Uh, those transcriptions indicate the person that he is talking to. He would try to find out the name of the person who made it, who used it, uh, how it was used, any types of details like that. We have in, in the collection on display at the museum some Meskwaki dice. Uh, it's a traditional women's game. We find in those transcriptions the exact uh, rules on how to play that game. One time, uh, some years ago, Jonathan Buffalo was visiting the museum with elder women from the Meskwaki tribe. We were going through the exhibit. They were looking at some of the materials. They noticed the dice, and this lovely woman reached in her purse and pulled out a little velvet bag, and she untied the bag, and she poured the contents out in her hand and in it was a dice game exactly like we had in the museum. Some of the members who brought materials uh, to, to Harlan uh, included uh, Young Bear. Uh, Young Bear was an elder Meskwaki at the time. His son John Young Bear, Albert Brown, Mrs., Mr. and Mrs. Uh, Fred Brown, Sam Slick, Bill Leaf, and Mrs. Whitebreast, whose uh, Meskwaki name I will try to pronounce, but I don't think I will because it's, uh, it's a difficult one. These are some of the kinds of materials that, that have ended up in our collection. It's a nettle bag. Mary mentioned those. These were made uh, out of uh, macerated uh, uh, stinging nettles that were then woven to create bags. There's an antler scraper, and there's a wooden, very lovely carved uh, wooden uh, uh, bean, uh, or bead, huh, excuse me, uh, bead heddle. He had a strong interest in uh, finding the kinds of, of uh, objects that would help illustrate, you know, the daily life of the Meskwaki, not just formal or ceremonial things, but uh, uh, carved wooden bowls. Uh, this particular adze was brought from Kansas by Tabashe. Tabashe was his father-in-law and uh, had been one of the men who came back to Iowa uh, from their uh, lands in Kansas in the 1850s. Here are some of the types of things, a feast bowl and feast spoon. Uh, this is uh, a boy's bow and uh, targets. Um, he also uh, collected things like lacrosse sticks and dice and other types of games that uh, uh, were played by the people. Uh, examples of, of fine danceware, uh, uh, ribbon shirts, um, hair, um, uh, hair ties, uh, belts, leggings all of these types of things. And my friend Jonathan just walked in. Jonathan, can you, can you uh, assist me occasionally if I have a Meskwaki pronunciation? Okay. Uh, this is a charm bag uh, that was part of a collection known as the Davenport Collection. Uh, the source of funds uh, was from uh, a bequest of Naomi Davenport, who was a granddaughter of the trader George Davenport. As a side note, <clears throat> that particular bequest was the uh, money that Harlan was using to acquire most of these. And later in my talk, I will mention uh, sort of the result of that as kind of the, the rest of the story on some of the characters I hope to introduce here today. Again, some of the other uh, elements of costume from the collections. This is a, a fan attributed to John Young Bear. It's made out of a golden eagle. 
And Young Bear also brought this mortar and pestle uh, to, to Harlan that we have in one of our exhibitions. Uh, this was a shotgun or fouling piece, and we know from the records that it was Wakiaki. Never mind. <laughs> uh, this is also a bow that was brought um, uh, by Tabache uh, from Kansas. An interesting thing about this bow is the uh, spear or uh, point that is in the end part of the bow. That is made out of a blacksmith, or a blacksmith had made that out of a file. You can still see the marks and other types of things in that. And I suppose it's possible because there were blacksmiths who were assigned to the Meskwaki that one of these may have been made by one of those blacksmiths during the um, period that they were either here in Iowa or down in Kansas and then brought back. Uh, there's no other accurate way of dating it, but uh, it certainly has that appearance. Um, this was a medal presented to Kishkakash by the people of Boston in 1937. Um, you can't really see it, the engraving on it is, is gone, but these were, uh, this is also a photograph of John Young Bear, who, or of Young Bear, that um, uh, helped Harlan with many of these types of things. Harlan had a strong interest in the public learning about the Meskwaki. Instead of just writing about what he knew, Harlan brought people to this, from the settlement to conduct public programs. Working and corresponding with Joe Cecina in Tama, Harlan arranged various powwow dance demonstrations around Iowa. He would personally front the cost for transportation and meals for the participants. Fees collected from the events would, in theory, cover the costs and provide an honorarium for each participant. It's evident from the correspondence that that was not always the case. There were events as early as 1924 in places like Dexfield Park in Dallas County and down in Corning, uh, Iowa of all places. Harlan began holding powwows at his acreage Willowbrook located in Altoona in 1927. He was especially interested in exposing teachers and children in the city of Des Moines to these programs. A bulletin from the Des Moines Public Schools, April 26, 1925, noted that Harlan appeared before a meeting of the Council of Parent Teacher Organizations to encourage parents and teachers to attend a demonstration of Meskwaki dances at the Coliseum on April 18th. In the fall of 1927, John Studebaker, who was then Des Moines Public School Superintendent, instructed his assistant, Miss Bessie Bacon Goodrich, to contact Harlan. He wanted Harlan to consult with the schools on a plan to improve their teaching about American Indian life. Harlan agreed to this request and enlisted the help of his assistant, Miss Halla Road, who is standing uh, up there in front of uh, this particular class. I want to point out a couple of things in this photograph. Uh, this was on the third floor of the museum in Des Moines, which until we moved it was fondly referred to as the Indian Room. Uh, she's standing holding a, a, a bowl. The little boy down in the middle of the picture has a um, mortar and pestle. And until we found this photograph, we didn't really know about that mortar and pestle that we had in the collection with no number on it, no association. We later discovered that uh, one of the projects that Hallow Road did as part of the Indian Life School was to develop a teaching collection for the museum of objects that could be used by children for hands-on activities at the museum. Now, mind you, this is in 1930. This is the type of thing that museums all over the country think is uh, commonplace or new and inventive, but they were really out on the edge at that time. Also, I want to introduce you to this particular class of children. The teacher right there is Bessie Kuhn. She taught at Ro or, um, Hubble Elementary School in Des Moines, and this is her class. Um, she would become a collaborator with Hallow Road in the Indian Life School. Um, <clears throat> for a number of months, a group of selected teachers met with Harlan and Road frequently to discuss reading assignments made by Harlan. Harlan believed that not all study could be done by books and written by white authors, and to this end, 
he added an element of cross-cultural uh, study with tribal members. Harlan ushered in what he called the Indian Life School. Um, these are some of the students on a field trip that Miss Rhodes was uh, conducting. And here is a teacher and a student in front of the Indian Life School on Harlan's property in Altoona in 1928. From a program for the school, Harlan writes, the Indian Life School is a new experiment wherein white people will be, quote, at school to the Indians while they try to put over to school teachers and others such information as would be helpful in the teaching of Indian life in the public schools. At the same time, the Indians present uh, present will, uh, be, be, sorry, will ask to be told what is in the white man's books about Indians. They may try to correct things they know are wrong. School began on February 18, 1928. That afternoon, teachers gathered at Harlan's Acreage near Altoona, Iowa, where some Meskwaki constructed a wiki up and set up a teepee to be used as a council lodge. Uh, Young Bear and his son George Young Bear were present. Uh, they went to a wiki up for a meal prepared for them. The meal consisted of pork chops, pork chops, corn, beans, boiled squash, and fry bread. Another Meskwaki at the gathering included uh, Sha'ata, Kwatashe, Anna Kaskatak, Wase. Waso say uh, and Susie Eagle. Uh, these women were there to prepare the meal. Your, uh, George Young Bear served as an interpreter, and a transcript of the questions and discussion was made, and Young Bear would correct the transcripts before they were made final. The Meskwaki told how foods were prepared, hunting traditions, making clothing, and demonstrated fl flute music. This was the first gathering at Willowbrook, but not the last. Harlan and his assistant, uh, Halla Rhodes, continued requests for this type of instruction. In late 1928, Harlan organized a series of gatherings. The meetings began on Tuesday, April 28th and ran through Saturday, April 1st. Transcripts exist of the sessions in February and in August. Uh, these were later published in the Annals of Iowa, where you can look at them yourself. Um, Harlan invited Dr. Melvin Gilman, former curator of the Nebraska State Museum and at the time on the staff of the Museum of the American Indian in New York to participate. Uh, this is a program that was uh, found in the collection describing the Indian Life School. Uh, Gilmore was most familiar with Missouri River tribes and asked questions that would compare and contrast differences, an important lesson for the teachers and people present. The culmination of the program was a two-day powwow. It was the second of several annual powwows held, hosted by Harlan on his Altoona property. Um, among the 18 teachers in the original class, Bessie Kuhn, a third grade teacher at Hubble Elementary, continued to work with Hallow Road in developing lesson plans for use at the museum and improving ways to teach uh, Indian life. There's Harlan uh, standing center introducing some of the participants at the powwow. Road began developing a teacher collection that I spoke about earlier. Uh, had been hired by Harlan in 1925. Jonas had studied at the Chilli uh, Chillico Indian Agricultural School in Oklahoma and at the Haskell Institute in Lawrence, Kansas before enlisting in the Army in World War I. He assisted Hallow Road in making presentations at schools in the Des Moines area. This is a poster for the powwow held at Harlan's property in 1927. And here is the full gathering of the 1927 powwow group. Uh, this article, uh, don't know the source, uh, it details Bessie Kuhn's third grade class trip to Powashik's village. I'm going to talk about that. In the summer of 1931, Jim Powashik, about age 77, and Jonas's father, came to Harlan's Willowbrook acreage. He proposed to Harlan that he build a traditional village on his property to show people how the Meskwaki lived in his parents' time. 
Harlan agreed to Pawashik's proposal. Harlan obtained permission from several people for Pawashik to collect elm bark, willow, basswood from their properties. He described the village as a fence square about eighth of a wooded acre, a winter house and a summer house with ta uh, beds, tables, and accessories. Um, this is an article from the Altoona Herald that uh, Harlan wrote describing Pawashik's village. Jim stayed at Jonas's house in Altoona but spent his days uh, at the village where he grew crops such as corn and pumpkins. He made flutes and bows and arrows, which he sold. He gave what we would call today a living history demonstration to visitors for a small fee of 25 cents for adults and 10 cents for children. That's about what it was to go to a movie, and you could get a whole lot more out of this one. The whole project <clears throat> is for serious scientific study and the enjoyment of all. That's your map to Pawashik's village. <laughs> Bessie Kuhn took her third grade class to visit and a transcript of her class's preparation for the trip and details of the visit fill an entire file in Harlan's papers. Um, it's really interesting. Uh, if, if any of you have ever received letters from third graders, if any, if you've ever worked in a museum and then received the thank you notes or something like that that you get from third letters from uh, third graders from their field trip, you can look back at these that were written in the 1930s and go, wow, some kids haven't changed at all. <laughs> about this time, Kuhn and Rode decided that there was a need for an elementary textbook about Indian life. According to a report by uh, Road that's in the Harlan Files called a uh, short sketch of the growth of teaching of Indian life in Des Moines schools with the help of the Indian Division of the Historical Department, Bessie Kuhn and I are seeing the need for a textbook on Indian life and decided to write one. This be work began in December 1931. It was complete in September 1932. Details about this book seem to be lost as there's no other information on the publisher, distribution, or even a name. However, another endeavor would result in one of the only children's books written about the Meskwaki, Shikishi. There's more images of Harlan. We can go back and look at some of these. This is an illustration by the artist Christian Peterson, who's both most noted for his sculptures that abound on the campus of Iowa State University. They commissioned uh, Peterson to do the illustrations uh, for this particular book. It was published in 1936 by Charles Scribner and Sons. Research for the book involved a number of trips to the settlement by Halla Road and the artist Christian Peterson to interview elders and for Peterson to make study sketches for the book. Copies of the book sold for 88 cents a single copy or 66 cents a copy for schools or groups. In other words, there was a classroom discount. It's a rare book today and is only on the shelves of eight libraries in the state of Iowa that I've been able to find. You can still find copies on eBay through rare book dealers for about 40 to $60 or 27 euros through some European book dealers. This groundbreaking work for the historical department came to an abrupt end with the election of Nelson Crashell in 1936. When Crashell took office in 1937, he dismissed Harlan from a post that he had had for nearly 30 years. Harlan and Rode both lost their jobs. Uh, Meskwaki people traveled to Des Moines to petition Crashell to reinstate Harlan, but despite their efforts, it was to be the end of a long career in preserving and presenting Iowa history to its citizens. Um, I mentioned before that there was a fund uh, that was given uh, by Naomi Davenport that Harlan was using to purchase these. Um, it was alleged that Harlan had misappropriated funds, misspent them, and did other sorts of um, bad things. Um, it was later found out that uh, uh, he was exonerated, that everything was on the up and up, the audits all came through correctly. But by this particular time, um, several years had passed and it had taken a toll on him 
physically and emotionally, and through some letters and whatnot that are in his personal papers, I believe his family felt that that particular crushing blow in his life later led to his death in the early 1940s. Haller Road and Bessie Kuhn continued their collaborations even after Road lost her job at the museum. Road became a teacher in the Des Moines Public Schools, and in 1939 they published American Indian Life. It was a book that was targeted to elementary students that featured pictorial and interpretive stories on various tribes. It was published by University Press Publishers. The only copy of record is in the Harlan Papers in the special collections at Drake University in Des Moines. Um, but it was a, a absolutely astounding um, piece of work that these women did at a time when popular <coughs> media, movies, and other sorts of things uh, were portraying a very vastly different picture about American Indians in our culture. Questions? What sort of political maneuvering removed Harlan from his job? It must have been some personal animosity or political activity. The question is what type of uh, uh, political maneuvering or activity might have caused Harlan to be dismissed? Um, I don't know the answer to that, but it is interesting that Harlan served in his 30-year 30, 30 career with governors uh, of both particular political parties and uh, served a long career that way. Somebody must have been out to get him, though. If somebody was out to get him, I don't know that the evidence is there, but... Uh, <laughs> yes? The question is, how many items did Harlan co collect during his career, and uh, whether or not we have located them all? Um, I don't know the exact number uh, during his particular time. The museum has been collecting Native American material even since that time. Um, but all of the items that uh, he, he collected, we know exactly where they are. Um, Power Sheik's village. Uh, it's probably an archaeological site at this particular point. <laughs> uh, we actually, one of our archaeologists, Dan Higginbottom, on our staff, uh, lives in Altoona and was involved with the Altoona Historical Society. And I don't know, they may do a site survey there. Uh, no. His son, James Harlan, uh, had a rather illustrious career. Well, this is a pretty specific question, but one of the Native Americans you mentioned was a man named Kishkikash. And I've noticed on an old 1840s map of Iowa that that was the name of one of our counties at that time, the county that I think today might be called Monroe County. I wondered if you or anyone else present might know the reason behind the change of that county name. The question is about an early county name, probably Monroe County, uh, named for Kishkakash and why that county's name has changed. I don't know that. Um, there are some accounts as some of the, um, as the Meskwaki were moved to different locations in Iowa after different treaty signings. In that particular area, uh, it's called the, there's the, what was called the Whitebreast Line. There is some areas where Kishkakash was known to have a village, and I don't know if that translated <coughs> to that. How it was changed, or when it was changed, I, I'm not sure. Do 
the question is, are there any instructions or descriptions of how wikiups were built? Uh, or any of the other artifacts like nettle bags or baskets. There are no specific instructions that, you know, Harlan documented. We have some photographs that show a wiki up that was actually built for a demonstration purpose in the 1930s for uh, the state capitol building. There was a small version of one of the uh, cattail mat wiki-ups that actually we have in the museum collection. It was done as an exhibition uh, element in the uh, 1930s. Um, there are some sources that kind of get into the description of how some of those things were made, but boy, after so many years of not thinking about that, I can't tell you where they are at the moment. Yes, sir. The question is how, how Iowa Indians from Iowa were avoided to be moved to Oklahoma? Okay. Well, they didn't. <laughs> um, within the uh, confederation of the Sac and, and, and Fox, you have the Sac and Fox of Iowa, you have the Sac and Fox of, of uh, Oklahoma, and you also have the Sac and Fox of uh, Kansas and Nebraska. Uh, the, when some of the people who located to Kansas who did not return were later relocated off lands down to Oklahoma. Um, Actually, if you look at the Iowa tribe, you have currently today the Iowa of Kansas and Nebraska and the Iowa of Oklahoma. Uh, the Potawatomi, who were here briefly, uh, have their uh, current lands in Oklahoma. So a lot were relocated uh, several different times. I I'm sorry, sir? The, the, the interesting thing in the, 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 a matter of choice as to where they located, um, we might ask Jonathan or Dee to comment uh, on that. The, my particular take is that when the Meskwaki came back and petitioned Governor Grimes to allow them to buy land here in Iowa, that was a choice and it was supported by Governor Grimes and actually the Meskwaki were not under a Bureau of Indian Affairs or anything like that for many, many years. For many years, they were considered wards of the governor. Well, if there are no further questions, I thank you very much for coming in here today and, and uh, celebrating our harvest and uh, there's more to more to go harvest so enjoy yourselves <laughs>